to Self Publishing Insiders. This is an opportunity for us to talk live with you and to bring in some special guests that we can talk to. We can talk to people from the industry. And today I am so excited to have in the studio with me uh, Scott Overton. Scott is a Canadian author. He's also a narrator, a retired DJ personality. And we're going to talk about all of those things. And I forgot to introduce myself, of course. I am your host today, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. So, Scott, welcome to Self Publishing Insiders. Well, thank you, Mark. It's always good to talk to you. And we've known each other for years. But I also want to thank Draft to Digital for doing this because I've worked with Draft to Digital uh, from the first time that I self published anything. So it's been a few years now. They really are a great service. And, you know, that's not just sucking up, they, they cover all the bases and get everywhere. And I, I find very few glitches. I can't remember any glitches that I've had with them, which is oh. rare in this business. You know? <laughs> well, thank you so much. I really yeah. do appreciate that. So uh, one of the things I wanted to uh, talk to you a little bit about is your work as an audiobook narrator. And for, and for writers in the audience, I want to focus on what the perspective is like from your side of things in terms of being an audiobook narrator. So the first thing I want to ask mm -hmm. is specifically... Um, why? Why did you get into audiobook narrator? Did you perhaps have a background in some sort of voice uh, uh, voice career or something? Well, I was a radio personality for more than 30 years, probably 35 years and plus, most of that time as a morning radio personality, and primarily in Sudbury, Ontario, which uh, you're kind of familiar with, actually. But uh, <laughs> so I was doing that. And then when I got out of that business, I thought, what what can I do as a freelancer? I want to make a writing career, no question about that. But on the on the side, you know, what can bring in some money? And freelance voice work was a natural thing to turn to. Of course, as an author and a lover of books, what's more perfect than audiobooks? Okay, cool. So uh, was that? Uh, I mean, you had been an author prior to that, and I know we're going to get into some specific author things, but yeah. At what point was this something that you thought like this is this is a feasible thing for me to to do? Well, I I mean I did record an audiobook version of my very first novel, which is called Dead Air, and it's a novel set in a fictionalized radio industry in Sudbury, and I actually recorded it. I was given permission to record it in our on-air booth at the radio station. Oh, so you were working at the radio station. Okay, because this was I, done with a with a traditional publisher. It was right, yeah. and and regional. Oh, that's cool. A regional publisher, and um, and I was given permission to do that for for making the audiobook. So I was able to do that ahead of time. So it wasn't like I hadn't done it before. I just had to set up a, a home studio to do it once I wasn't uh, in the business anymore, which requires very small space because you want to keep it soundproof as much as you possibly can. And then from there, you just kind of need, you know, a workstation set up, which doesn't have to be on the scale of a, of a radio station or anything like that. I have a, I, I work on Mac laptops and I have equipment set up to that. I've got, as a matter of fact, in my home studio, I have an Electro Voice uh, microphone that is exactly what I worked with when I was on the air because I was comfortable with it. I loved that mic. And so I bought one for myself and our, our E20, I think it is, it's very quiet. So I needed to have uh, an, a USB interface to go with it, to interface with the computer and then also boost it with a, a preamp, which I do. So you, those are the kinds of things that you can do, but you don't need much more than that to actually be set up for uh, for audiobook recording or any other voice recording for that matter, good internet connection and uh, software to work with. But there is a software program called Audacity, which is free. It has a lot of great plugins, so you can do that or you can buy one of the many other good uh, workplace software for that, if you like. Wow. So uh, so tell me a little bit more about the mic and roughly the cost. So, for example, a, a mic that I'm having here, and this is for any listeners not watching the video, um, it is uh, Blue Yeti, uh, which is USB-based mic. Uh, and that was, I think I managed to get it for $150 or so. So the Electrovox sounds, it sound, just even sounds like it's a more expensive uh, mic. And then you had to get the yeah. amp. And the... It, it is. Um... I mean, that mic in particular, I, I can't remember. I bought it a few years ago. I think it's in the neighborhood of $300, give or take. Okay. Um, and then you buy the interface, which 
it could be 150 to 200 dollars a preamp in that same range okay and but still you know that's not a huge huge investment it right. costs more money sometimes to get on some of the audio platforms to get your work out there or some of the marketplaces online i'm not all that impressed with most of them i don't tend to find a lot of work from most of those online voice platforms however right. find away voices has sent me you know work i've done a number of books for them i've done books for you uh, yes. we know each other but you also uh, connected through find away voices so yeah yeah that, that is true so uh, just back to the home studio um briefly so you've got uh set up is it is it a certain room that's dedicated to this is it a corner is it like some people even use a closet like how do you have that set up mine is basically the size of a closet i built okay. it with this in mind but i built it the size of a closet it doesn't really need to be bigger than that although you got to watch that it doesn't get too hot while you're recording and spouting <laughs> all that hot air right Especially but in the people, summer, right? Yeah. <laughs> and some people do use a corner of a room. If you've got a quiet enough space, it's fine. But that it is important to have a really good quiet space. You don't realize the noises that go by on the street, you know, car traffic noises, or maybe a loud furnace that you've got in the house, or the neighbor's barking dog, or whatever it might be. Those you cannot have in an audiobook. Or a podcast. A lot of these same things would go for podcasts. People may tend to be a little bit less stringent when it comes to podcasts. Right. But so that depends on personal tastes. You really have to eliminate all of these background noises that you possibly can. They can be eliminated to a degree in software post-processing. Right. But anything you do in post-processing degrades the quality of the sound a little bit. So if you do a number of different processes, it will degrade it to a noticeable amount. Oh, cool. So yeah, and that, that is something that you don't realize until you're doing the professional quality because that's what's happening, right? You're being hired as a professional. Now, what are some of the things, because uh, again, I want authors to understand from your perspective when you get a project. So for example, when I've handed you a manuscript or, or we've agreed, uh, I think we did the first one, we did it through Find Away Voices and then afterwards, I thought, well, we know each other. I'm just going to pay you directly. I think that's how we yeah. did the second one, right? Yeah. Um, what what yeah. what are some of the things to consider? Like when you receive a manuscript, what's kind of the first thing that you do once you've, well, maybe even before you take the job, do you, how do you decide what you're going to take? Well, that's a good question too, because you know you, you want to read over the manuscript and decide whether it's something that you want to record or not. Even in in the same I find a way voices profile, there's a question that says, "Will you?" Uh, perform narrate erotic content things like that right. you want to be sure of your decisions on that and and work with an author that you feel you can work with so first of all it has to be a manuscript that you want to be able to record and you want to believe that they're going to pay you it's good to work with an organization you know find a way will make sure that you will get paid other organizations as well but working individually one-on-one -on -one, you do want to make sure that you're going to get paid. So then you consider how does the author want this book to be read? What kind of narration do they want? In the case of your Canadian Werewolf in New York series, it's a noirish kind of feel and a first person narrator. So those mean a certain kind of thing, which lends it, itself actually well to my voice, which is a little bit uh, a little bit gruff. And so it works well. That's another consideration. Is it the kind of delivery that you feel you can do for a whole eight hour long book? Because that's a good full length, typical commercial novel length. Or, you know, many of the ones I've done for Findaway have been nonfiction. And if it's a topic that you don't agree with, you probably don't want to have your name attached to it as a narrator. But if it's something that you feel is good, it's well done, high quality, go ahead. And then you just negotiate. But we have talked before about some of the steps that a narrator has to take. You have to uh, look up the punctuation of uh, the, 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 I want to say, how you pronounce everything. The pronunciations is more what I'm trying to get at of names, of places, of uh, strange words, words that aren't used that often or that you're not familiar with and not entirely sure about their pronunciation. You owe it to the author and your audience and your own reputation to look up all those pronunciations. Thank God for YouTube. 
<laughs> and, not, and I don't mean the pronouncer ones because the pronunciations are often wrong on some of those. Here's how you pronounce this word. Right. They're often just terrible. But you can find videos that might be about a particular place or they might mention a historical figure or a real life figure who figures into the book. And even, you know, one of yours said in New York, um, I had to look up the pronunciations of some of the place names just to be sure that they were right. Right, right, right. It's not the Brooklyn Bridge, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that one I'd be pretty sure of, but there are a few others that you just don't know what the emphasis is, and especially when it's local. Yeah. I mean, in fact, there was one, and there was one character where he's talking about the Roosevelt Hotel. Well, some people say Roosevelt, and some people say Roosevelt, and oh, I thought, yeah. is this character somebody who would say Roosevelt? No, I'll go with Roosevelt. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah, and, and and so you have to know the character too to know how they might want to. They they might by default or where are they from? Where would they pronounce? How would they pronounce it? Yeah, in some cases, and particularly you know, the certain Midwest towns pronounce things in a certain way, or they may pronounce their town in a way that everybody else in the country thinks, what, what, what did you say? So you <laughs> need to get those right. Another one that you have to get right is the character voices. If you're doing fiction. Yeah, you've got all these different characters. Some of them are going to be an opposite gender to you. They are maybe different nationalities. So you have to think about the accent. Some of them might be described as having a rough voice. So I guess really to back up, first thing you do is read through the whole book. Right. Read through the whole thing to get um, the feeling for the tone of it, the feeling, the sense of the characters. And you don't want to find out halfway through that this character is described as having a deep, gruff voice, and you've been having him like this, you know, with fairly high <laughs> whatever. You could be having a foppish sound to him or whatever, and you're really wrong. So you've got to figure out all that stuff ahead of time. I suggest then recording some samples of those character voices and sending them to the author and saying, do you like these? Um, what do you suggest? Would you like it different? Yeah. I, and, you, and you've done that for me. Yeah, uh, as well. I remember you said send them. It's like, well, I'm not sure about this one character. What do you think? And so I get to listen to it. And so there is there is obviously some back and forth with the author that you just want to say, hey, here's how I've done this, or here's how I've pronounced. Um, this is how a, a local person from Toronto who says Toronto, right? That kind of thing, <laughs> as opposed to someone from anywhere else in the world. Um, I, I guess those are some of those elements that you sort of not negotiate, but you have a back and forth to make sure the author is cool with that. It's a relationship, really. If you want to do a good job for both you and your, you know, your reputation, your author, and the book, so people won't complain about it. Because I've read reviews of books where they trash the narrator, and I listened to it. And I thought, they're right. Yep, yep. Too bad that book deserved a better narration. But you know, if you work all these things out, you're you're going to be closer to getting a quality product. You're going to do the best you can anyway. Okay, cool. And then I guess the other thing that you'd mentioned you you were work you worked on some projects that were sent to you from places like uh, Find a Way or was it Scribd was one of the other ones as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, actually, that was through Find a Way too. But when Scribd was going in a big way for um, a lot of samples, they they did these almost I call them Reader's Digest condensed versions of books that people could listen to. Oh wow! And I did a whole bunch of those. One of those being um, set, you know, in the Bataan Death March. So it involved real people that some people, none of them were probably alive still, but, you know, relatives would be alive. You had to find out how they their names were pronounced and all of these different place names in the story, which was right. tough. It took me hours, actually, for something that ended up being about a 20 minute narration. Wow. And and that I want to get to that. So you know, um, an audiobook. One, some of my audiobooks are anywhere between eight and ten hours, right? It's usually about ten thousand words per hour. But that's finished hour. That's not yeah. Scott Overton in chair doing the work. So what what's that kind of work entail? Like when when you start off, and then I'd like to kind of walk through that process a little bit, so authors can really understand. It's not just guy in front of microphone just read stuff and then that's it. That's it, right? No. Well, I mean. When there's a, a big studio involved or, you know, big operations involved, they have somebody who will be an engineer and operate 
the recording equipment while the narrator just sits in a booth and, and does the narration. And that's all they really do. And the, narr uh, the uh, operator, their engineer would say, okay, that, uh, that kind of sounded fluffed a bit. Um, do that line over for me again or whatever, or you got, you missed that word. Let's do it over. Once it's all done, they might find things that they want to redo. And the engineer would be the one to actually do that editing and, and put these pieces back in there. Um, but if you're doing it as your, your own self, as a one person operation, the narration part of it is probably the easiest part, the most straightforward part. Once you've got your equipment set up and all these other things worked out, then you read it and you fluff something. You There are kind of two ways to do. You can uh, either stop and cut that back together later, cut out the error and just start over again at the beginning of that sentence where you made the mistake. Or you can stop right then and kind of back it up a little bit. And most uh, workstation software has what they call punch and roll, and you can just kind of move it along and save some editing later. But then you got to do the cleanup. If you've been making any mouth noises or you've uh, got noises in the background. I've actually had the occasional time where I'll hear it and, and a plane has gone overhead. I didn't hear it at the time. Wow, because it was so sensitive, right? Wow. When I'm, It's just your brain doesn't pick it up while you're reading it. You don't think anything of it. It would be the same as a car going by on the street, a loud truck or something. Right, right. But when you're listening it back, you're going, what is that drone? And you try and think, is there any way I can fix that? No, I actually have to re-record that part and then splice it in. Those kinds of things generally take anywhere from three to four times as long as the actual narration, people will say. And there are lots of different things you can do that will, you know, in software to eliminate some noise, noise reduction, or eliminate some of the mouth clicks. But again, anytime you're processing that, you're degrading the sound quality a little bit. So you, the ideal thing is to get the cleanest possible narration to start with so you don't have to do that much processing afterward. And it also saves time. Wow, that's amazing. So so a 10-hour audiobook is really a full week, and I'm talking a full 40-hour work week at least, right, of, of work. It, probably more. I after. Say, yeah, I would say for, for most people that are doing it all themselves. If you're not going into a studio and recording it for for somebody, uh, but if you're doing the editing and processing and then uploading and everything like that, I would say that's probably a fairly good ratio to work with. So that's why they charge but per finished hour. Or in some cases, you know, find a way voices has not wanted a per finished hour. They wanted a fairly raw recording so that they can do the processing themselves. But that's something you work out ahead of time in your contract. Oh, that's that's kind of interesting. I didn't I didn't realize that there were the the, al the alternate types of contracts. Yeah, where you're hired for your voice talent, and someone else will be the producer or the engineer or however. What, what are those roles called? Do we know? You must know. Um, sound engineers generally. Okay. Yeah. All right. They might call themselves producers. Yeah. Is there your experience in radio and broadcast for for decades, thirty years, right? Um, and I know you had a mic you love to, to work with, so that's what you bought. And you're like, hey, I'm comfortable. I've, I've, I've spoken into this kind of mic for years. I love it. I know I know how it works. You, It's, it's kind of like you understand it, right? It's it's a partner of yours. It's a, it's a, it's like your sword, yeah. right? <laughs> well, it's like that picture that you posted for, for this, you know, this particular event. Uh, microphone that I'm pictured with, I think, in there is that is the same one. Yeah. Oh, that's the same one. Okay. So, but but were there things that you learned in the studio? Because you were, and again, you were doing live broadcasting, uh, which is a little bit different. Obviously, a lot uh, a lot a bit different. But were there things that you picked up in the in radio that were just natural to you that maybe you think somebody coming into narration wouldn't know? Well, I I think that what it is is just being able to use your voice as a tool to get the flexibility and being able to get across the sounds that you want. In live radio, you want to sound friendly. You know, I was a morning man, so you want to sound friendly to the people who are waking up every morning. <laughs> you don't want to hear somebody who sounds grumpy or stiff or whatever. So you have to get that. You have to learn how to get that smile in your voice when you're recording. And if you're sounding sad or you're trying to sound a dramatic news read kind of thing, depending on what it is, your voice is a tool. 
So that's where the experience of being a broadcaster comes in. Lots and lots of experience day after day talking about subjects of everything under the sun. And you don't talk about a plane crash in the same way you talk about somebody's birthday party. You know, um, there are great differences in the kind of tone that you want to get across for different things. Right. And using your tool to express emotions or, again, make these, you know, character voices, all those things you have to get um, develop with your voice. And so practice helps a lot. Wow, cool. So now I want to I want to pick up that other aspect of your life uh, as a creative person. So you do voice narration professionally uh, for you've done it for your own projects. You've done it for myself and other authors. You've done it for companies, uh, entities out there looking for uh, professional narrators. But you're also a writer. You're um, primarily a science fiction uh, writer. And yeah. I'm curious about so how does Scott Overton balance the, the, the two different competing <laughs> work brought projects that he has on the go, because you are still producing novels and, and writing regularly. Yeah, well, I mean, you do have to prioritize things and paid work has to take priority. And after the paid work, I tend to try to make my, my writing a priority. But recently, publishing has been taking all the time. I haven't been able to write very much. People sort of say, has, it COVID, has COVID been good for you for writing? And for me, it hasn't worked out that way. Although it hasn't affected my life all that much, uh, I, it hasn't really been the bonus for writing. I have spent a lot of the time on the publishing end of it. As you, as an author, know too, Mark, you want to work with a professional editor. You work with a professional uh, cover artist so that when your book comes out, you want it to be as good as anything that's on those shelves anywhere. Right. And so there's a lot to that. And if you end up publishing yourself as well, um, that's a whole other skill set and takes a great deal amount of time publishing and marketing. So balancing all of that, I, I don't say I've got a handle on that by any means, but paid work would come first. And then right. from there, it's, well, what needs to be done? If I need to get something done for publishing this next book, as I have a new one just launched yesterday, uh, or if we're into some marketing thing that's time sensitive, that's got to happen. Or do I finally get a chance to sit down at my latest work in progress and write it? Okay. That's kind of the way it goes. So uh, I, I do know, uh, I mean, I know you have had uh, works traditionally published uh, with um, mm -hmm. regional publisher as well as stories. Uh, as well as uh, then experimenting when you get the rights back on some of those pieces you've self-published. So right. what was what was that journey like uh, in terms of your writing career? So when, you know, the first novel came out, you got a, a publisher for it. What was it? Do you have an agent or how, do, how does that whole process work? Well, the first book was published by a regional publisher in my home area. So okay. it was a natural thing. He He specialized in books about and set in and by Northern people. Right, okay. You know, Northern uh, areas, whatever it was be, Northern Ontario particularly. Right. So that was a good fit and I didn't need an agent for that. Um, but, but we had a good working relationship. He didn't have to do that much editing. There was some back and forth where he would send me, you know, edited versions and I would approve or disapprove or change things the way he wanted them. There's always some of that. Um, I did at one point have an agent that was well positioned, but didn't find a deal for me. And that was some years ago. So, I mean, authors tend to feel if you get an agent, which you really have to do if you want to get a big publishing contract with one of the big five publishers or their imprints, you know, you've, you've hit the jackpot. Once you get an agent, you're there. And that's unfortunately not true. And it's also very, very hard to get an agent. It's extremely difficult. And when you do, it's no guarantee that they'll be able to find a deal. It's it, the publishing industry, as you well know, Mark, is in f flux right now. It's just a crazy business. And I don't know how it's all going to fall out, but it's, it's a tough thing to try to get a big publishing contract. And agents aren't necessarily the answer. I still would like an agent, no question about it because I would like to be able to be traditionally published for various reasons and do other publishing on my own, what they often call hybrid 
nowadays authors uh, do both. And and so you did mention uh, yesterday, I guess February second, twenty twenty two, you just uh, released uh, indie published uh, one of your latest novels. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the latest novel first? What's it called? And and I really want you to share the log line for uh, for listeners. <laughs> Actually, just give me a second. You're hold up a copy of the book. I bet. <laughs> you explaining that to anyone only listening, not the watching. The video. Yeah. The cover is not going to be as bright in okay. this light as it as it really shows up yeah. to be. But if I can get it right, there we go. The dispossession of Dylan Knox. Man, I don't hold these up to cameras. That's very okay. Much. It's kind of like that weird mirror image thing. That's confusing. It is. It okay. is gorgeous cover. So, so yeah, so it's a science fiction guy, thriller, right? Three people in behind. It's a kind of a hard, a difficult concept in a way to describe about a woman who encounters her. Uh, former high school sweetheart, she bumps into him at a work thing and he doesn't remember her. He acts like someone else and she wonders whether he's maybe an imposter who means harm to her boss. She works for the Secretary General of the United Nations or is he perhaps a saboteur because he works in a space energy uh, project and so she spends time with him and he acts like a different person almost every time she turns around. There are like three different personalities in here and there's a whole lot that goes from there. But yeah, the name is a bit of a play on words because possession, we think of, you know, evil spirits possessing someone, right. taking control of them. Dispossession, when something or someone gets bumped right out of where they belong and replaced taken over oh, wow. so that's uh, the title so it's a science fiction a techno thriller science fiction thriller basically mm -hmm. but your log line speaks to something different and i want to i want right. to analyze that just to get into the mechanics of it to help writers understand this well first off i write science fiction and the science fiction that i love to read and write is theme based it's not just one darn thing after another. I like to have real themes that I explore. So the theme of this one really is who and why do we fall in love? Who do we fall in love with? Is it the person we see or is it who's inside them, who they are inside? Can that inside person, that inner person make it so that what they look like doesn't matter at all? And so here we have that question where the, the main character in The Dispossession of Dylan Knox struggles with love in this particular case, where what she sees on the surface, Dylan Knox, her old high school flame, is not who's really there. And so I, that's how I wanted to explore it. It's a good theme for ahead of Valentine's Day, I guess, right? There you go, a little bit. And that's something people can really understand because it's a sort of a universal question, right? Yeah, it is. How much does does love depend on the surface? Surface beauty and attractiveness. Right. Or is the attraction deeper than that? And I personally believe it is much right. deeper than that. Love anyway. We can be attracted to what we see on the surface. But love, yeah. I think, takes more than that. Takes Yeah, it takes something deeper, to something underlying. So... I guess the question I have, so, um, it, you know, science fiction writer, when, when, and, and we're going to get into how you've sold some books in person, but um, when somebody approaches that and they were like, oh, I, I don't read science fiction, because maybe they're thinking uh, Star Trek or Star Wars or any of the, the typical media uh, science fiction. Yeah. Uh, how is it that you kind of explain uh, your brand of science fiction to them? Because they may just go, ooh, I don't read science fiction. I get that all the time. Well, I don't like science fiction. Well, and you're absolutely right. I think when they think science fiction, they may think Star Wars, which, you know, that's a whole other question. We won't Science fantasy, think. more like. <laughs> but they almost certainly are thinking of TV and movie science fiction, like the movie Alien or whatever it might be, uh, Lost in Space, spaceships, and space battles. And that's not what I write. I almost exclusively write present day or near future stories that involve real people as real as I can describe them, strong themes. And this particular book is set in the present day, although there's a time element to it, uh, that it is set in the present day. There's not a lot when it comes to technology or exotic science or anything hard to understand 
in it at all. I mean, it's not like it's uh, try to make your brain work hard. If there's an interesting concept in there, great, because that's fun. But uh, science fiction doesn't have to be all those strange things or too freaky or weird. I mean, the last novel that I brought out was about an alien infiltrating a person's body and the two, the human and the alien, had to come to an agreement and communicate, learn how to communicate and work together. That was a book called Naida. And Naida was the alien entity. It's a strange concept, but if you read the book, it was not that weird or hard to believe as you read it. So right. you try to get a, a concept that might be a little bit odd, yeah. but it helps you to explore these themes in a way that reflect our own society, which I think the best science fiction does. That's cool. I, I love that. Because, yeah, even even in, in Naida, you have the, okay, we, we're, we're sharing this body now. These two entities, these two minds are sharing this body. How are we going to get along or not? Like that's, that's some of the questions, right? Um, which yeah. is kind of... Um, it will think about it during the pandemic. It's okay. We got to live in this space together during lockdown or whatever. How are we going to get along? Kind of universal, I think. Yeah, I think so too. And certainly the question of who we love and why we love them is always, you know, it may be one of the most universal questions ever. So when you get a, a way to present it, I, I, people ask why I write science fiction because I really can't think of new ways of telling stories that don't use some kind of science fiction premise. Another story about families and their trials and tribulations or, you know, society as it is now that we see, I just don't come up with those ideas. What I come up with is some science fiction concept that goes, hmm, I can use that concept and explore who we love and why we fall in love. And that'll work. So that's kind of the way I go. I love that. I love that. Now, now, so speaking of uh, universal concepts and universal questions, one of the questions all authors have is marketing. How do I do marketing? Now, I know when we finish this live broadcast, you are going to go and record uh, for a local television station. You're actually going to be interviewed. It won't be a live interview, but it's going to be probably aired tonight uh, on, on, on CTV, which is a national yeah, television absolutely. station. So, Yeah, I'm not sure when it'll be aired, but usually I think they do day of. Same day. So, so how did how did you score that? Because you know, authors, hey, I get to be on TV. <laughs> how did that happen? Well, there are a couple of parts to that question. For one thing, if you've got any kind of in at all, uh, it helps a lot. And I'm fortunate enough that as a broadcaster, former broadcaster in this town, I can you know, I know a lot of the people that are in the media. And if I don't know them, they probably do know me. Or they at least respect the name, you know, because they've heard it. So that helps. But I mean, first of all, you've got to figure out who the contact people are in the media that you need to reach out to and send them a news release. And the news release has to go, you know, something like for immediate release. And this is a great headline. And you can think of it in terms of a blog post or a social media post. It's not exactly the same animal because they're not looking for exactly the same things. But some of the things are in common, like a good, strong, hook, a good strong headline, and then your text of describing what is the story about from their perspective, a new local author with a new book, or maybe a new way of looking at love in right. time for Valentine's Day. And you describe a little bit of the plot of the book or whatever, and your then your credentials and other links that they will need to uh, fill out the rest of their article if they're writing an article for one of the press or uh, in the case of an interview uh, with TV or something, you've got to make yourself available, but give them enough so that they know their viewers or readers are going to be interested in that subject. Right. If you can't convince the media person that talking to you, writing about what you've got is going to be interesting to their readers. It's going to serve their readership and thereby them, you're not going to get a call back. Okay. So it basically it's not, hey, Scott has a new book is not an interesting news story. But this new book by a local author asks the question, who do we love? The person on the outside or what or inside how a person looks or who they are inside, like that sort of thing. Suddenly you're like, oh, okay, that's that's a little bit more. Uh, approachable than oh Scott wrote a book great what, 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 so yeah. right. is that who is that, is that a possibility 
you know, why do I care that you wrote a book? Well, and it often helps if you're in a certain area and you're local, then you will be news to the local media. And they like that. They, they're they looking for content. Uh, but yes, if you can find a hook of some kind, or many people will say, you know, look in the news and and look at what special days are coming up, Valentine's Day or any other holiday. Is there a way you can tie what you're talking about into one of those things or something that's recently been happening in the news and legitimately tied into it. It can't right. be way out there with a very tenuous connection. Well, I and mean, yeah, because I, I, I wrote in a cafe and JK Rowling wrote in a cafe. So for the anniversary of Harry Potter, you should talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, yeah, that's maybe not going to work all that well. If you have a personal connection with anybody in the media in any way, you've met them someplace or, you know, you've researched them and you found out they like um, riding horseback. I don't know, whatever it is, any kind of in will help. Right. If you direct, if you can directly contact someone in the media that you think is the person you want to get out, uh, get this information out, most of the media addresses will be editor or, you know, send of release here or whatever right. if you can find some more personal name to attach to that is better too okay now you talked about personal connections and i know you've had some success uh selling your book not necessarily although you have done local bookstore events but at other events where you can sell the books can you talk a little bit about about that and what your experience has been like well you know it's it's interesting we think nowadays that everything is online and we all of our books have to go from Amazon or all of these other Apple or Google Play or whatever. And that's where we're going to sell. If we don't, we're not going to do any good. But you can sell, admittedly, small numbers of books in person at things like market, markets, farmers markets, indoor and outdoor markets. And I have done that over the past year, especially um, going out once a week, spending a few hours at this market at a table with a fellow writer. And we draw people over to the table and say, hi, you know, we're local authors. And these are books that we've written. And some of them are actually set here or partially set here. And I feel like a hawker sometimes, you know, hawking my wear. <laughs> it is kind of like that. And right. uh, they do appreciate once they realize, hey, well, wait, you're a local author. You're not just selling anybody's books here. You're a local. I'm going to come over and have a look. And they will. And then you can talk about it and talk their ear off. And they, if they're interested, if they're a reader, they'll look a book over and you can say, and, you know, we can autograph it. Or if you're giving it to somebody, we can uh, personalize it for them. You, you know, hey, uh, here's to Aunt Martha and hope you enjoy this blah, blah, blah from Scott Overton. They really like that. And especially if something like Christmas is coming up or, or where they've got a birthday coming up for somebody. I know um, my last book, I had one guy, a friend of ours, but he really enjoyed the book and he bought copies for all the members of his family, like almost half a dozen copies Wow! for giving his presents. And, and that there is a personal connection because how often uh, the average does the average reader get a chance to talk to a live author, right? It's kind of a fun experience too, isn't it? I think so. I think they enjoy it. If they're a reader, they can talk for a long time about books because it's a love that we share. If they are, in my case, a particular science fiction reader, we can talk about other science fiction authors that we both love and books that we both love. Uh, and if they see, you know, those four or five books that you've got there sitting out there and they go, wow, you actually wrote all those books. It's impressive. And it, it, you can develop a really, really good relationship. And of course, if you if you're good with people and are friendly and nice and you don't waste their time and everything, it's it's a relationship like no other. And and it's the best relationship you can get as an author reader kind of connection. So I urge people to do that. You don't get large numbers. If you get maybe, you know, 20 books that you sell in a day or something, okay. It's not a huge number, but that's pretty good. That's generally considered pretty good. Even right. if you do a book signing, a book launch in person to do 20, 25 books is probably pretty good. Yeah, it actually is. From my experience working in bookstores for years, that, that, that yeah. really successful book signing. I mean, not yeah. a Brandon Sanderson style or a Stephen King style book signing, but but right. still for, for the average author like us, right? Yeah. <laughs> the other thing I was I would argue is that if somebody buys the book on a, well, we're in Canada, so maybe maybe Kobo is the default, but Americans listening might say on their Kindle or on their iPad or whatever, 
when they buy an ebook and it goes into their ebook reader or their nook, whatever, it, it's on the reader and, and it's there. You can read it, which is phenomenal. But yeah. your book, when they buy a print book, is a billboard or a walking advertisement because it's on someone's shelf. It's on someone's coffee table. It can be loaned to a friend. And that's kind of word of mouth advertising. Yes, it is. And there are two things that you, you're um, reminding me of. One is that I buy all kinds of books and read on a Kobo. I buy all kinds of ebooks. They sit there and I may forget about them because I'm buying so many. A print book sits there reminding you to read it, first of all. So it will most likely get read. If it's autographed, it makes it something special to that person. So whether it's a gift from someone else or one that they got and they talk to you and you autographed it, it makes it special. They're more likely to read it, probably more likely to like it, more likely to talk about it to friends and other you know, book lovers that they know. Who knows what their circle is? Maybe they've got all kinds of people. Maybe they're in a book club. And they may lend it to people very well. And some people may say, oh, then that you're, you're encouraging them to lend it to people. You're not making a sale. You know, sales are great, but readers are better. To me, it's more important to have people read my books than to sell a book to somebody who may never read it. I don't care about selling books to people that may never read it. Honestly, I want a reader. And if they say, I love this book, I'm going to give it to my sister and she can read it. I'm going to give it to my uncle and he can read it. I say, more power to you. Go ahead and do that. I just want to have reader. I'm glad you loved it. You know, go ahead and do that. And if they want to buy one of my other books because they become a fan that way, hey, that works too. Cool. I love that attitude. That's a very open attitude about, uh, again, the importance of the actual reader that because is actually going to connect with that book. That's phenomenal. So thank you for that. I do want to remind listeners that Draft to Digital does have a print uh, program. It's in beta right. right now. So if you have an account, go to the print tab and click that little button that says, please add me to the print wait list. Just last week, we added 500 more authors to the beta, and we're adding hundreds of new wow. authors to the print beta. So, Yeah, I've got to check that out. I mean, currently, I've been using other methods to, for print, although I've used draft to digital for digital things uh, forever, and, and also books to read, which we didn't mention yet, but for anybody who's familiar with draft to digital that's fine. They know books to read with their universal book links are the same company and linked. But if you didn't know that, the universal book links are fantastic. This week when I was launching my new book, The Dispossession of Dylan Knox, I used that, yes, that universal book link on everything. Every, yeah. every Facebook post, every blog post. Your every press release, I think. Press right? release. So you have, just for anyone listening, not watching, so you have bookstoread.com, uh, which has links to all the all the platforms that it's available on, but then you've right. you've custom named it to slash dispossession, nice and easy for people to type in. That's and right. Yeah, I mean, it, the one that they generate automatically has all kinds of different numbers and figures in it to start with. That's the default, but they do give you the option of customizing it. And so, if you have a name that you want for it, um, my author UBL is Scott Overton. If right. it's available then you can get that and customize it. It's much easier. This one's Dispossession. My last book is books2read.com.naida. Right. Uh, you know, those things make it so much easier for readers to get to your book. So it's really, really great tool. And uh, hats off to draft. <laughs> well, thanks for that, Scott. That, uh, so uh, some comments I wanted to pop up really quickly as we're getting close to running out of time. We're having so much fun. I, I'm losing track of time. But uh uh, Tom uh, says, I'm going to pop this up, uh, says, I'm with you, Scott. I'm doing a series of alternative history sci-fi set in the first decade of the 1800s. More of the story is about people rather than the technology. Yeah, isn't that true? I mean, I've I learned at one point that every story is about character. You can have the greatest concept. You can have the most exciting snap minute by minute plot with action galore. If you don't have characters that people care about when they read, it's not going to be a good book. They're not really going to enjoy it. They're not going to remember it. It's all about the, the characters. And you and I have talked about um, Robert J. Sawyer, who's Canada's number one science fiction writer. And one of his novels, Rollback, is yeah. about one of a couple 
being able to be rejuvenated and the other one it doesn't work for. And, you know, it's such a human story that you got to love it. There's not much technology in that. Right. That's true. Yeah, and it is know. a beautiful love story. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And one more comment, uh, last comment is coming up from Kit. Uh, Pet peeve, wide volume range narrator shouting <laughs> hurts my ears. Wow. Well, I mean, uh, if, a, if an audio book is produced by a professional person or produced by a company like Find Away Voices, I don't think that's going to happen because they set it within a certain range. Like even Audible and ACX, their self-publishing audio arm, Audible right. books, have a certain requirement of a volume range that they're supposed to meet and they're not supposed to go beyond that. So they're not supposed to be able to hurt your ears. Right. I'm not sure what those, where those books are coming. Maybe out. it's coming from podcasts, right? Sure, that yeah, it could be that. It could be. So uh, Scott, I want to thank you so much for hanging out with me today, talking about audiobook narration, talking about writing science fiction, doing different book marketing. Uh, I, I guess uh, we can let, let people know where they can find out more about you. Absolutely. Yes. And I mean, I do have a Scott Overton author Facebook page, so you can find me there. Um, yeah, we're going to be doing a, a book launch event coming up on Friday that'll be streamed on YouTube. I do have a small YouTube channel. If you search Scott Overton, there are a number of others on YouTube, but my, my channel you'll be able to find with my picture and on Goodreads and uh, lots of different places. Maybe we can put some of those links in the in the uh, notes. Comments. below. Yeah, excellent. Well, Scott, thanks so much. And thank you all for uh, listening to Self-Publishing Insiders. If uh, if you want, take a look. There's a little subscribe button. If you're on uh, YouTube, you can check us out there. Uh, we're on YouTube. We're on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, all the fun places. Basically, as Kevin Tumlinson often says, just pick a URL and slap draft to digital on the end of it, and we're probably going to be there. So, again, Scott, thank you so much. Thanks to the live you, audience uh, you. for your questions, and, uh, and uh, have a wonderful afternoon.